All right. Uh, well, uh, this is Casey Cole Corbin. Um, my teaching business is called Dynamic Fluid Art. And then my other business is called Dynamic Fluid Art Teachers Business teaching business coaching program. And because I coach um, a lot of uh, the teachers of this art form all over the world, and it's uh, a lot of fun for me. I talk to a lot of people, um, Australia, England, um, other places. And so that's, that's really cool to be able to have um, in this world that we live in today where technology can help us with that. So um, I am, when I make videos, I'm constantly, uh, people are telling me that I speak too soft. I do have a soft voice. And so I am going to try to project and to also help with that is I bought a uh, really nice mic. And so uh, this, this mic is, it's, it's obscuring your view just a little bit, but I think it's worth it. You don't need to see me anyway. So uh, what, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to um, uh, talk about whether or not, uh, just the initial question, so many people have been fed over from the what selling page in effort to uh, take care of some of the piles of art that they're very passionately make to be able to turn a profit with those. Um, some people just have the intention of being able to be able to buy some more supplies so they can continue their habit. So it's uh, you guys um, are very much like a heroin junkie. <laughs> I've done a lot of substance abuse counseling and I can tell you um, a lot of this and myself included does meet the definition of <laughs> addiction. Uh, that's okay. All right. So it's, it's healthy uh, to a certain degree. We, um, uh, and you can see my studio behind me, which is a total mess. We were also moving, and so the whole house was a wreck, and I don't have time to um, pick up or clean up uh, the studio right now. But like you, you can see, let's see here, that shelf has got probably 12, you know, pictures, uh, pieces uh, thick. There's some on the table behind me here. They're lining the walls, stacked up in the hall. Um, and so I'm like you. And so I was like, what can I do to uh, either feed my addiction or to be able to turn this hobby into a business? And so like you, I first thought, well, let me sell my art. People like it when they see it. Um, and so we started the What Selling group uh, about a year ago. And um, and that's been helpful for people. And we've had some really great interviews. Like um, it was three or four weeks ago that we did the interview here with Sandra Lett. And she talked about how to sell. And that's been great. And how to sell for more than just recouping your costs. You know, so if uh, she, she sells in three figures, not two figures. And that's really what it takes. And, uh, and that's great. And if that's your heart and passion, um, I encourage you, you know, to pursue sales and just, you know, being an artist. However, what uh, most of us have found, myself included, is that in this really exciting trend of acrylic paint pouring, flu fluid art, flow art, where uh, the money is, is teaching. And you've, you've already had this proven to yourself whenever uh, you show your art to somebody and they go, wow, yeah, that's really cool. And they look at it. And the next question isn't, um, can I buy that from you? The next question is, how did you do that? Why are they asking that? They're asking that because they want to know how to make this art and you can teach them. And I like us. And Sandra's interview, she said um, that to be an expert, you only have to know a little more than the person that you're talking to, the person that you're teaching. And so everybody that's on here, if you know how to do a mix and do a flip cup and do a swipe, you are good to go. And you could teach a class tomorrow because you, I guarantee you, you know more than the people that are going to participate in that class. And so you have something to offer them. And that, uh, that, that has a lot of value in this uh, trend uh, that we're in right now. So uh, how do you know if this is a good fit for you? Well, let's talk about um, several different things. I've got, I've got a four question quiz for you. So uh, if you want to just write down yes or no to these four questions, and then you'll just be able to self-assess or evaluate where you are in this process. The first one is, is do you know a little bit more uh, than the next person about this art, right? Do you have something to teach? Are you a step ahead of them? Now, all of us, and this is what I get commonly, I've, I've literally heard this from hundreds of people that I've talked to in private message, 
uh, individual one-on-one -on -one conversations where they say, I want to get this down better. I want to become, get my art perfected. I want to get my mix consistent. Well, let me tell you something. I've been doing this for over a year uh, in this current form. I actually wrote a book on pouring art seven years ago. And so I've been doing this for a long time. And I don't have my mix consistent. And I don't know anybody that has their mix perfected. And, you know, if there's a too thin and too thick, is why, why I teach it in my classes. And then the, the middle here is perfection. All right, that none of us are going to achieve this perfection. We're always going to be a little bit on this side or a little bit on that side. And that's the best that I do whenever I teach them how to mix, is I'll go around and I'll stir it and I'll look at their mix and I'll say, hey, uh, I think that it's, you know, it, it probably is just a little on the too thin side or it's a little on the too thick side. I wouldn't do anything about it because if you add one drop of water to this, it'll probably, you know, go the other direction. And so you, I think it's as good as it's going to get, but just so that you know uh, how your mix is, it's maybe a little too thin or a little too thick. And I'm just giving that feedback so that they can um, better hone their skill next time. However, um, it, this is a this is you cannot achieve perfection uh, in this. Every paint out of the tube by the same manufacturer, every paint out of the bottle by the, the same brand, and some is thick and some is thin. So you've got to adjust it from that. So it's a uh, I've accepted it as an impossibility to reach that um, perfection there in the middle. I want to get as close to it as I can, but without an expectation of perfection. So. Um, you probably are good to go. Uh, you probably could teach a class tomorrow and really wow them and dazzle them. The second out of the four questions for this assessment is, is do you have a love and a passion for this art? And something tells me that if you're on these groups and something tells me, especially if you're taking the time to listen to this goofball right now, that you have a passion for this art. So I'm pretty sure you can give a yes for that one. The third one is, is do you love people and do you love helping them? And so if you're going in, if you're approaching this as I'm going to go help these people because I have a love for people and I really want to help them, that is going to show through and that's going to do um, some really amazing things in your classes. The fourth one is, is can you learn how to teach and are you willing to work to refine your process? And so if you're willing to grow, I am not a perfect teacher. Um, my own story is, is that 20 years ago, I was hired as a counselor in a program and they lied to me. It was not, I thought I was going to be, you know, talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, to people as I laid on a couch and I s just sat there and went, tell me about your mother. And, you know, no, 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 that didn't happen. I was, t I was teaching 20 out of the 40 hours a week in the classroom and had a tremendous fear of public speaking, absolutely hated it. And uh, I had to overcome that. And now I love it. Now I love doing that, even though I am an introvert personality style. So you can too. You just, uh, I had to be open to learning. And as, as long as you're open to doing that, you can improve. But you just get started and you improve as you go. Okay. Speaking of improving our, our teaching, I promised you three pro proven methods to be able to improve your teaching. And so the first one is, is that as you approach your class and as you structure your, your class ahead of time and while you're in the class and then later reflecting on the class, how it went and how you can make some improvements for it next time, what I want you to focus on is the student's experience, not your performance. You catch that? And it's a subtle difference, but it puts them as priority and that their experience when they come to your class, is that a good experience, is it a nurturing experience? Are they walking out of there going, that was awesome, right? Um, because if you have the goal of them walking out of there and go, they were awesome, Casey was awesome, right? That's kind of an egocentric, you know, uh, and it, that's gonna show through, right? If you're trying to dazzle, trying to impress, if you're seeking other people's improvement, that is not a good way to teach. And so I encourage you to develop a, uh, a focus on the student's experience. And so the second way is, is related to that is, is to create a tone or an atmosphere in your learning environment that's um, relaxed and fun, experiential and experimental, that you can try things and take risks and you don't have to be fearful about that. Um, and I, I wanted to just show you, I always give these surveys. I'm afraid that this is going to be backwards. So for you, I, I, yeah, I think it is. But these are, these are my surveys that I give to every one of my students. And as I just kind of look through some of them, um, th this, this, this point is made, you know, here is it says, um, Casey made it so much fun. I was completely relaxed. 
um, which is not my usual class experience. Okay. Uh, this one said, um, uh, I, I learned that you can be free and not perfect. Okay, so that same thing that I have on myself, I'm not planning on going in there and being the perfect teacher that does everything just right. No, I can be imperfect, I can make mistakes, but more important to that is the student experience. And I think that really it kind of sets people at ease when you're not perfect, when you when you bumble things up, you know, like I'm jump, I've already jumbled my words in this live right now. And you can get comfortable with that. And it doesn't have to be something that uh, freezes you or per, uh, paralyzes you. And by the way, as a counselor, perfectionism paralyzes. It stops you from moving. And so acceptance of our flaws and imperfection and that's still okay. Uh, that's all right. You know, it, it moves us. It helps us to be able to go forward. Um, here's another one that says a great group of people, friendly and complimentary. Now th that speaks to the group more than it speaks to, wow, Casey did a really great job. But to me, that's one of the biggest compliments because I worked hard to set a tone and atmosphere in that group that they picked up on and to, and it's going to make our next point, you know, um, uh, even more impressive, which is, I'll go to it now, which is the third point about this is to foster connections and relationships within the community, within the uh, art group that you're with. Okay. So, um, some of you have seen the post that I that last um, Saturday. I was in St. Simon's Island. It was a great group. It was sold out. There were 16 people packed in the room, and they were a great group of people. And I am very sarcastic. I can be very biting in my sense of humor. And I had several people on here list about how funny you know that I was. And sometimes I have to be careful <laughs> about crossing the line with that. Uh, but that's just that's just my personality. Of course, your class is going to be totally different and have a different tempo, but it can still be focused on the student's experience, not focused on you or your performance, okay? So um, with um, fostering that connection, I want you to imagine the idea, kind of, you, know, you could even close your eyes right now and think about the classroom. You know, you're up front, there's all these students around you, is that uh, with the first student over here that there's a string, like a piece of yarn or something that's connected from you to them. And that's your connection with you to the student. And I'll see that among like, uh, and maybe in using my example, all 16 of those people that are in that classroom, right? But then there's also a string from them to you. And so there's two strings within all those different relationships. And so that's 16 different forms of communication. My communication to each of them individually, their communication back to me. And now them having a string connected to all the other students too, and them having a string there's a lot of string connected to all the other students in the room. And now you can imagine if you were standing above it and seeing this net now being created by all these strings or all these relationships and connections. And this forms a, a net and we'll call that a safety net. This net catches you whenever you fail, whenever you fall. And so if you create that relationship with everybody and helping everybody be friendly, accepting and experimental and, you know, take risks and it's no problem. Um, to do that, then you create an atmosphere that's really great. And I'll tell you that one way that I do that, I do that in a lot of ways, but one way that I do that is early on in my initial introduction presentation is, is listen, everybody, this is not like a paint and sip class. This is an all day workshop in which you're going to gain some skills that you'll be able to take with you and implement into your life and be able to do this paint pouring for the remainder <laughs> of your days. It is not that you're going to do. So, you know, in a paint and sip class, you go there and you're like, OK, I'm going to paint, you know, this farmhouse and I'm going to leave here with this painting and I'm going to hang it on the wall and I'm not going to really paint any more farm farmhouses. It's not really encouraging me to do things on my own. But my classes in particular, maybe you structure yours differently, is that I am empowering them to be able to no longer need me. They can do this as they uh, as they learn these techniques, they can now do it on their own. And so the basics, they only come to the fundamental classes, the morning part of my classes one time. And then I have a lot of uh, returning clients, uh, returning, excuse me, returning students, uh, month after month after month that return for the afternoon. And that's a themed pour, like a waterfall or colander or um, structured swipe, you know, cl class. We'll do three of those projects every every afternoon. And so my repeat students, they skip the morning, they pay a little less, and they come in just for the afternoon class. But I have them that return month after month after month 
And part of the reason for that is because I'm thinking about one lady right now, you know, that uh, we were just we were just chatting about my class coming up on Monday and she comes back and then it's the, she, she could do this on her own and she watches the YouTube videos and she doesn't need really me to show her a calling to pour. She can figure that out on her own and she can do that on her own. She's coming for the community. She's coming for an accepting environment in the class that, that's good for her, that she, that's nurturing for her, that's um, building relationships and building friendships with her. I don't know about y'all, but I have a lot of older people, people in their 70s that are attending my classes. And, you know, unfortunately, they may have outlived a lot of their friends and they may not have a whole lot of friendships and they need some kind of venue. They're no longer working. They're no longer going to school. They're no longer doing those types of things. And they need a venue to be able to make friendships with things with people that they have in common. And so a lot of neat relationships have been formed and continue on outside of the class. And so that's part of the goal that we want to um, establish. So those three things were focus on the student's experience, experience, not you, um, create, work really hard to create a learning environment that is based on acceptance and no fear. And in fact, I even had a, um, yeah, this one went on to say, there's no right or wrong way. It's very freeing, this person you know, wrote on this. Great. And the last statement they said is, Casey's style is comfortable and open to everyone and encouraging. Hey, that is, <laughs> that's spot on. That's exactly what I want to hear from uh, the people that attend my classes. So, so uh, forming those connect connections and relationships. Very good. Um. All right, so the next thing that I wanna to talk to you about, and the one thing that I wanna offer you to anybody who attends, we'll get to the Q&A part towards the end. I've got, I'm a very structured person, and so I've got my structure you know, here first, and then we'll go to the free-floating <laughs> Q&A um, that are already in the chats um, there. Is, uh, and I will send you this. Um, if you will email me at caseycolecorbin at gmail.com and I'll put my my email address in the link later in the in the chat box there is uh, and I'll send you this document it's kind of like a blueprint for being able to build your business and what I consider the most essential first step and the way I want to frame this for you is this is a strategy or a plan for how you want to structure your business but first of all I want you to think about three years from now what you want your life and your lifestyle to be is this a part-time side hustle thing that you do once a month and it pays for your family's vacation? Is it, uh, does it replace your full-time income? And so you no longer have to work at the current job that you have now. Is it part of building something slowly so that in 10 years, 20 years, whenever you retire, you'll have additional income then and you could maybe ramp it up then. What is your, what is the, how does this affect your lifestyle? How invasive do you want this to be? One of the things that I had to do, you know, I, I, had, I had a huge advantage in overcoming something that we all have, which is subconsciously sabotaging ourselves because we, because of our belief system, we don't believe that we deserve to make a lot of money from this. And you can very much is that I got fired. Some of you, a lot of you heard my story already. I got fired uh, right before Christmas and all of a sudden I had to turn this part-time. I had two part-time things that I was doing, my private practice and my counseling and life coaching and um, doing these crazy weird art classes. And I had to ramp them up to replace my income very quickly. And God really blessed and we, we haven't missed a beat. And it's just amazing to me how, um, one month, it's more of the counseling that uh, meets our budget, and w one month, it's more of the art. But but generally speaking, I'm making providing for my family. The majority of our income right now is coming from teaching these crazy art classes, and that's a lot of fun because they're building, and you know it just continues to expand every month, being better and better and better. So I'm I'm really hopeful about where it goes into the future. One question that people ask is, you know, you know. Can you, you know, this could, I could see this being a part time um, thing for me where I um, am able to have some side hustle income. Or, but I, and I could also see how it could replace my full time income. But, uh, you know, can you get rich doing this? And I think that that get, gets us back to the conversation that we had with Gretchen Wheeler um, two weeks ago on Friday, 
where she said, you know, where she has built her business and she has eight artists that work for her that do the classes. And she's expanding now to doing an internet offering. And so, um, you know, yes, I think very much that once you get into opium, not opium, but o OPM, other people's money, other people's time, other people's resources, and you get that multiplication effort, now I think that that is something that you can become, um, uh, get wealth from. So I might, ext might extinguish my ability to trade hours for dollars in this thing and kind of reach a cap on this. And, and right now that would be a pretty high cap. That would be pretty good. Um, however, I can also multiply what I'm doing uh, through hiring other people to do this and trying different venues the same way that uh, Gretchen is. So, And I have plans on uh, two new venues. Uh, currently, my MO uh, is to go to art venues. And this was one of the questions that was asked, like um, the art centers in your area um, and museums in your area and see if they offer classes and then you do them there, they keep six, uh, 30 to 40% of the split. And that is so worth it because they have the re they have what you need. It's not the location. It's not the fact that they also set up your room for you and clean it up afterwards. Uh, the, it's not the air conditioned facilities, fa facilities that they have. It's, it's, those are not even the important things. I mean, I could rent a garage somewhere. I could rent a, you know, somewhere else a whole lot cheaper than the 30 to 40% um, that they're, they're keeping, you know, for doing that. It's not even that, that they're doing the enrollment and the payment process. What you're going for is their list, not their location. It's their list. So each one of these places have 3,000 people that they do an email blast to um, every month, that they have newsletters they send to, um, 5,000. Uh, one of them has 7,000 members of it. And they, they, this is your target art audience right here. And so you're not going for their location. You're going for their list. The, the fact that they provide a place for you and those other things is just kind of a bonus. <laughs> but it's worth the 30% just to be able to have the list of people to be able to market to. Good. Um, this will get us to a, a structure first about the lifestyle that we want, as I was talking about. Right now, I am, I've had to make some changes because I have, my kids are back in school from the summer and I don't want to miss every Saturday with them. Right now, I could fill every Saturday uh, of every month with a reoccurring class. And some of the venues I've had to tell them, um, I'm going to go to every other Saturday or I'm going to go to quarterly on a Saturday. And some of them I said, I'm only going to do a weekday with you. And so the people that want to come to that, they can, um, I'll either just get the, the folks that uh, do have a, a fluidity in their own schedule, uh, retired, self-employed, people that have a flexible schedule, and even people that can just take a day off. They have days off, and so they could spend it by coming to one of my classes in the weekday. And that's just a choice that I'm making because of my lifestyle. I do not want to be away from my children that much. And so during the school year, I cut down my Saturdays that I do. The other side of that is, is that part of the lifestyle, like I just illustrated with you last last Saturday, was that I got to take me and my family to an island and um, enjoy that. And they were at the beach while I was teaching. And somebody saw the pictures, they helped me set up and then they uh, went off to the beach and then they came back and picked me up for lunch. <laughs> we had a really nice lunch and then came back and uh, then they came back at the end of the day and helped me clean up. And so that was that was real nice because I'm used to doing all that on my own. That's part of the lifestyle that uh, we like too. We also have, I'm, I'm working on a mountain location in Pine Mountain, Georgia, to be able to teach at uh, some of the art centers up there. And that's a, an, uh, kind of a, my business is now paying a, in a tax deductible expense way, uh, my vacations for me and my family. And so I'm literally, I look at the school calendar and all the three day weekends, and I've got most of the rest of 2018 uh, scheduled and quite a bit of 2019 scheduled for um, the days that uh, my kids are off and we're taking off. We're going to the beach, mountain, other locations that um, uh, are kind of neat. So, in fact, we go back to the very same island that I taught at last Saturday, not tomorrow, but next weekend to catch the people that were on the waiting list. Um, 
there. So that's a pretty exciting opportunity. And everybody that attended, literally every all 16 of those people came and told me, I'm coming back in two weeks. <laughs> I don't know if they'll make it or not. But they just had a really great experience. And again, that's not because I dazzled them with my with my teachiness. Okay, no. It's uh, I put a lot more effort into creating that atmosphere, creating that environment. And so that's uh, very important for um, you to do. All right. Um, let me just kind of do a tech check with you because I am not seeing any interaction on the YouTube channel. Are you able to see this? I'll put that into the YouTube channel. Before I go to the strategy plan, which you'll want to see. I'm going to check and see comments in the group page on Teachers of Flow. All right, very good. All right, so um, I'd love it if you're listening to this live, if you would comment in both of those locations that yes, um, you're there. Just the a why or a yes would help me to see how we're doing with, because uh, I haven't done one through YouTube's um, Google Hangouts before. So, all right. Um, I'm going to now share my screen over to... Um, the strategy session homework, which again, I will give that to you if you will email me. So this is going to get a little strobey here in just, just a second. It's going to get kind of weird. There we go. Share. There we go. Okay. All right. So from here, you should be able to see the name of my um, coaching business is From Good to Great Life Enrichment Coaching. And so that's why that logo is there. And this is the strategy session. And so we're going to go through this. This is really what I do whenever I do a strategy session with uh, some of y'all. Um, and you uh, contract with me to do that. You, I email you this. You, you fill it out as best you can. And then usually we take um, not one but two sessions to go over it. And that also becomes a format for a lot of Q&A for how to do things. And so the very first thing that it talks about is building a SaaS team. And so if you see at the top, the structure, accountability, and support right there, that helps us to be able to continue to do what we need to do. And let me tell you, that was instrumental in me being successful in teaching my um, dynamic fluid art classes. Back in uh, December and January when I needed to ramp it up, I had already created the page, and I'm so glad that I did. Being the uh, admin and moderator of the page made me kind of the central hub of the information that came through there. So you guys have taught me so much, and I have all that knowledge, not because I'm so smart, but because I just listened to uh, what other people had to say, and that affected the way that I structured my business. And so I want to pass along that information for your benefit, so you can structure it as well. And listen, if you if you're not trying to build a big business, if you're not if you want to, if you're not trying to you you don't hate your job, you want to continue to be able to um, uh, do that work. And I understand that you're not wanting to go full time or grow something really big. Let's say that you just have a heart for um, being able to do these classes. And maybe so many people on here has have talked about. Um, really just ministering to the elderly or to VAs or to other people, maybe a special interest group that they just have a heart for. Well, that is absolutely wonderful. And I encourage you to do so. But guess what? You still got to structure your classes. You still got to do your work. You still got to, you know, if you're going to do it well, you're going to put, um, you know, effort into doing the things that we're talking about here. And honestly, you still need to go through a process like we're talking about right here, whether or not you ever make a dime. Now, what I think you'll find is, is I have done a lot of free classes, especially when I was in that learn before you earn stage. And I've continued to do a lot of free classes. Uh, some of you may have noticed the, the post my wife taught uh, art during uh, summer school as uh, she's a teacher. And we uh, one day we taught 125 fifth graders <laughs> this art form and they did 125. 25 uh, four by four tiles that day. I went through a lot of paint that day. 
and taught them the flip cup and boy, did they love it, right? I was so tired at the end of that day, <laughs> taught nine students at a time uh, in shifts and uh, <laughs> I would total it 125. That was a lot of fun. And I actually learned a lot too. I learned about a different style of teaching and I don't usually teach kids. My wife does that. I like teaching adults. So um, <laughs> my joke is, is that I always say that uh, I don't like children. I love my own children but I can spank them. And that's probably one of the reasons why I like them. <laughs> so I don't normally teach um, people, uh, strangers children because <laughs> I can spank them. Hmm. That's just my joke. All right. Um, so the first thing is an introductory statement. This is really talking about why you need a strategic plan. And it also talks about time periods. And, and then if there's you have a partner, that means why, why authors is plural there. If you're not doing this on your own, then who is authoring this plan? Who is, who is involved in the creation of your plan? It's probably just you. And again, we want to understand our lifestyle, how we want it to work in the future. And then we build our business plan to to go around that lifestyle, what you want it to look like, right? And people say generic things like, I want to make a million dollars. So do you? No, you don't. You want the benefit of having a million dollars. You want the freedom of having a million, 10 billion, you know, dollars. You, you, that's what you want. And so the monetary amount isn't nearly as important as the reason why or the uh, your motivation for wanting to quit your job and do this full time, uh, whatever it might be. That is what you should go after. And so think about that. Think about three years from now, what does your daily life look like? What does your weekly life look like? What's your monthly life look like? What is even your, uh, in the, the course of the year? There's certainly a seasonality to this. <laughs> a lot of the museums um, that, I, that I teach at um, and made really good money with would not let me teach a class during the summer. Why? Because they were so full of their kid activities. And as I thought about that next year, that's going to be awesome. And my wife's a teacher, you know, <laughs> we're going to, you know, ideally, I don't know that I'll make it next summer, but maybe the next is, is that we're going to get our um, part of my lifestyle choices that I want with all this. What I'd like to happen is, is we're going to get our passports for all the kids. And I would just love to spend a month in Europe and let that be our, um, our summer. And so that's great that I maybe can't teach as much during the summer because those my venues are full uh, doing things for, for kids. That works out well in the seasonality of this business, right? I already talked about going to destination locations during the holidays, whenever we have three-day weekends, four-day weekends. Those types of things are great for us because we can... Um, uh, take advantage of that. Other people are going to those destinations too. And so their venues can can market to them. Um, the next thing is about your background statement. And so this is talking about you and your personal history, um, you know, what kind of strengths and weaknesses that you have. And if you are, you know, employing other people or you have a partner, then really what is your your strengths and weaknesses? And then also it says there in parentheses, see story brand. If you guys are unfamiliar with StoryBrand, it's a great book. Um, I listen to books on tape. It is. It talks about in your marketing and in your branding of who you are. Like I am branding dynamic fluid art as an experience for people to be able to enjoy, right? Not just go to this art class and learn something. It is an experiential process in which they enjoy every minute of it and they have something to take away from that, right? You know, so I'm building my story around that. And part of my story is my slogan. My slogan for Dynamic Fluid Art is, everybody's an artist, they just don't know it yet. And so that helps me to be able to reach other people that uh, aren't going to be reached. Um, my venues are going to automatically reach out to the people that are artistically motivated. And then my marketing is reaching out to a whole nother sector of people that do not even know that they would really enjoy this class. And so those are my favorite stories to share. Uh, even on here, I've sh shared uh, stories about how a uh, uh, class that I had uh, a month or two ago, and there was a doctor there a surgeon and he was told five minutes before class started by his wife that you're going to go to this class. I've paid for it. Go. <laughs> he showed up in his lawn mowing clothes, <laughs> his yard work clothes. And he said, my wife said to come here and he loved it. He said he hadn't done any art since junior high 
And he said, he's coming back to the next class. Okay. Well, that just really excites me. The, those are the, those are, that's a uh, good that we have reached um, that person and expanded our marketing that way. And so that's part of your story. It's part of how you're branding your business. Uh, there's been a recent post started by Kathy on this group about how to pick a name for your business. Um, dynamic fluid art was one that came to me very naturally. We were talking about fluid dynamics and I was like fluid dynamics and, and, and a totally unrelated and a sciencey conversation. I was like, well, wait, that's what my art is. My art is fluid dynamics. And that's one of the reasons why we gravitate towards making waves and other forms of water or even just the way that the universe looks because that's fluid dynamics too. I mean, everything is flowing <laughs> up there in the Milky Way. And so uh, dynamic fluid art just became a real natural um, connection for me and is part of my story. The next section is talking about organizational structure. And I do want to point out that um, th it's very easy to start a sole proprietorship. People talk about getting a business license and stuff. I don't do that. <laughs> uh, maybe someday it'll come back to bite me. But but really, one is, is that, you know, if, if I did that for every business that I started, then I would have... 30 wasted business license in my life right now. You know, they, they never went anywhere. So uh, I do pay taxes, you know, on it and I do have a business account. And so all that goes in there and I'm legit, you know, on that. But, um, but if you're going to another venue, you know, if I was to open up my own studio, I'd get a business license, right? Uh, but you don't really need one and you don't really need, you know, all the hoops and stuff that people will tell you that you have to jump through before you start. No, start and then you can back up if you need it and you can do those things later. I will point out to you that the weakest organizational structure is a partnership. And so it feels secure if you and a friend that really like flow art are going, let's do this together, you know, and you want to uh, build your um, fluid art business, teaching business together. It feels like, you, you know, she's got my back. He's got my back. You know, we can we can do this together. But what happens if you guys have a rift? What happens to your client base? What happens to your equipment that you bought together? You know, what happens if you need to sever? It's worse than a divorce. You know, it's just you. That is something that uh, it, for me, I refuse to do any more partnerships. What I do is I do a structured alliance with somebody. I do affiliates. You know, we um, I work with other organizations like, you know, the venues. Um, you know, I may hire somebody to come in and to teach, you know, a class for me, but I'm not going to do, God willing, I am not going to do a partnership. Um, again, those just get, um, can get really, really hairy, especially if you have different visions for where you're going and what you want to do. And one person saying you have to work this Saturday and I said, I did, did not <laughs> start this business to, um, make me, you know, do anything. So, that's, uh, you know, just part of the organizational structure. It's good to have a mindset about that. Later, I might, I'm a sole proprietorship now. Later, I might incorporate or do an LLC. You know, it gives you some liability coverage. Um, currently, I don't feel like that I need any of that. And I don't really need insurance um, for myself. The venue, you know, covers anything that might happen. Um, if I was renting, you know, a, a place on my own, a hotel room, a garage, a uh, um, <laughs> mini storage facility, Kathy, then I would have to cover my insurance, you know, that way. I know Kathy does that um, with hers, but um, th this way is a great way to shoestring this thing and to benefit from um, opium, other people's uh, time, other people's money, other people's resources. So, all right. And so your vision, what, where, and it kind of has been the thing that we've just been talking about, you know, where do you see yourself three years from now? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? And so you have to have a vision and then that carries the next points about what are your values, what's your mission statement, what you know, the, that your vision helps you to be able to answer these types of questions. The values talk about the principles in which your organization, um, how it abides, you know, what you do, um, what you don't do, right? Um, I love Gretchen, you know, she shared that, um, you know, the people that she contracts with to do private parties and the people that she does not. And, you know, some of them say, we want to do it this way, not that, not your way. And she says, well, we're not the organization for you. And she lets that pass, you know, for, for her on different points. And that's smart to do. You know, you really don't want every opportunity that comes your way. It is it, the way that life works and the way the business works is, is that some of those times you need to pass on some of those opportunities. They're not a good fit for you. A little drink of coffee there. 
All right. Um, and so that brings us to the purpose of your organization, which is your mission statement. Why are you doing this? Now, initially, you might be thinking, I just need to make some money to pay for paint. <laughs> well, that has a tendency to grow, particularly as you start teaching and you're starting to touch lives. Um, in the Matt Tomya uh, interview, we talked about how there was, um, uh, you know, in this world that we live today, even the way that you're hearing me right now, this high tech, low touch. Uh, that's real hard to get personal. That now a lot of our relationships, the people that we talk with, the conversations that we have is over social media and they're, you know, <laughs> a thousand miles away or on the other side of the planet. And so that means that, that that's what low touch means and high tech. So our, the tech is now supporting those relationships. When you get into teaching these classrooms, let me just tell you about a story real briefly about um, uh, the about a lady that's come to five of my uh, afternoon classes now. And, you know, God bless her. I, I know her. We've become Facebook friends. I know that she, her family experienced a tragedy uh, a few weeks ago. And so while we were teaching class and doing this, I came over to her and I was just helping her with her project. Everybody else was kind of busy. And she just kind of looked up at me and she said, you know what happened? And I said, yes. I said, I'm hurting so much for your loss. And she started to cry. And so I put my hand on her back and I said, I'm, you know, we just, just comforted her probably just no more than a minute or two. And then I redirected her to her, to her project, you know, and offered to help her with that. Right. And so that's all that that environment would allow me to do um, with her. I'd love to do more for her, but that just human connection, um, and, you, and I'm a counselor, you know, you don't have to get that personal, you know, with people. I wouldn't expect that, you know, necessarily with you. But but that that high touch environment, that's going to have an effect on your mission statement. And maybe you haven't experienced that yet. Maybe you've been doing these classes for a long time and you're just listening because you want to enhance mm -hmm. your your teaching business. And that's great. And I'm here for you on that. But th these kind of things kind of develop after a while. But you can imagine you can you can think about. Um, you know, what your mission might be and about being more than just money, about being in connection with other people. And so that's part of your mission. Problem statement. Now, this is something that you go, okay, what kind of problems am I having? Uh, you know, getting started or what do I anticipate? You know, we don't want to be acting in fear or uh, anxiety or worry about these things. Instead, we want to act in, in concern. You know, I have a concern that I'm not very good at public speaking. What can I do about that? Well, that's a good concern to have. That means that you need to practice. You probably need to go do some volunteer classes for some uh, Cub Scouts groups or your church or um, another organization, you know, uh, just a uh, bunch of friends, have them over and teach them, you know, learn to be able to teach, be able to speak, you know, in front of people. That might be, you know, a legitimate thing that would go on your problem statement. Maybe speaking isn't a problem for you. Maybe finances, you know, that you, how am I going to pay for all this paint and these canvases, you know, um, that's overcomable. You can come up with a solution for that. But um, you need to kind of know what the problems are and anticipate them. There's something called a SWOT analysis. And if anybody wants uh, that, um, it's actually linkable off of this whenever I email this back to you. That's that, um, that blue region right there. A SWOT analysis is a, a kind of neat way to be able to look at your strengths and your weaknesses and determine what it is that you need some help with. And so I definitely have had to do a lot of that. All right. So your goals, what is your, and this, you got to break these things down. So a long-term goal, where you want to be three years, 10 years from now, now make it into measurable objectives that are broken down into actionable steps and have a timeline for how these are going to be accomplished, who is going to accomplish this, and then also how you're going to evaluate whether or not you succeeded. Now, the way this could work is, let's say you have not taught a single class before. And maybe right now you go, okay, I'm going to set a goal that next week I'm going to contact 12 of my friends and see if any of them want to come over to the house next Saturday. And I'm going to teach them how to do this flow art. And maybe you'll have, you contact 12 people, maybe three or four of them will actually be able to show up. That's a great start, you know learn before you earn. And that's a small actionable step, right? Maybe yours is, let me begin a relationship 
with the art community in my area. That's something that I had to do. I had I, I had a little experience with the local art center in Valdosta, Georgia, called Turner Center for the Arts. And I had to establish, at first, it was a little hard to get in, to be honest with you. And they didn't know me. I didn't know them. And what it really took was a raving fan that attended one of my classes in another town actually um, helped become a segue to getting into the town <laughs> that I'm closest to. And that, that I have found to be true everywhere I go. And you'll learn to pick up on those. You will have somebody in your class. This happened to me just two weeks ago. Um, and this lady, every time she was, she was kind of a quiet woman, but she did, every time she did something, she's just standing there and go, wow, wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, she's seeing the results on the, on the, uh, on her canvas. And I, I know I just kind of, you know, started working with her when it was lunch break, you know, we, we actually, you know, went to lunch together. I usually go to lunch with, um, a lot of people that are in the class. It kind of makes it almost like a retreat, you know, experience together. We go to a nice restaurant. He's always given an hour and a half break, you know, for lunch so that we can have a nice lunch in our schedule. And I got to know her and that seemed to even foster even more of a connection. And uh, she has been my number one raving fan for the last two weeks. She has been posting like crazy. She's been talking about this great guy, um, Casey Corbin. She's been sharing all my posts. She's been going to my dynamic fluid art page and she's liked every picture that's on there. And she's liked every comment on there. And she actually, um, she lives in another town, not the town that I was teaching in. And she is talking to the art community, two organizations in the art community there for me to come to those and be able to teach there. So you're the, the greatest asset that you have in building your art teaching business is, is help um, these, these raving fans and give them opportunity, give them means to be able to share the message. Uh, you know, maybe that's business cards. Maybe that's just staying in contact with them. For me, it's usually the same way that we're talking right now is over Facebook. I just have, you know, we've chatted and talked about things. She's asked me questions. I've solved problems for her. She's been thankful. She's connected me to other people uh, in um, private messages and say, you got to meet this guy. You got to go to his classes. And that is what builds your, and I am not, you know, Matt Tommy is a sanguine, what's called an otter personality style. He's just real easy in front of people. That's not me. That's I'm, I'm least of all Matt's personality. I wish I had his gifts. Every time that I do that, that's been skill. I had to earn that. So my, my skill is doing the background work. I can set things up and I can do a pretty good job of preparing, which is one of the reasons why I can probably help you with these kind of things. The next thing is, you know, evaluation. What is the, how are you going to evaluate if you're on task? Um, we call these, you know, uh, your key performance indicators. And there's another link, uh, linkable click there um, that you could, when, when you get this email to you, and it discusses what those are, and you can talk about how to build those. Um, and how you can really just stay on track. Now, people say, I have no idea how it's going to go. It's okay. You still need a plan. We're going to go with monitor and adjust. We're going to go, this is what I want to do. I want to have a goal that 12 months from now that I am teaching in three art venues around me monthly. And every month, and I have reoccurring students that, that come to that. And those uh, raving fans help you out with that. And then you, you, so, so you you talk about building a relationship with with them. Maybe you start attending some of their things. Maybe you become a member of the of the center. Maybe you just kind of go there and start talking with the education director, the person who schedules the classes there. And you have some real low pressure opportunities for them to have a class with you. And maybe it's not now. Maybe it's later. And Usually, mine ramped up pretty quick. I'm grateful for that because I really needed it. But, uh, but usually, you got to start building these relationships, and they start taking months before you're actually able to schedule a class. And so that's that's important that you have a long range plan, and then the the small goal, uh, very specific steps, baby steps even that you can take for accomplishing those. And then, uh, then this is just a summary that you you end up with, you know, as, as far as what's uh, a summary of your plan and how it works. And so that's the basics there of your um, uh, strategy and building a strategy for that. So I'm going to stop sharing now. So you have to look at my face again. I apologize about that. And I'm going to take a look and see.
Boom. All right. So, Denise, you say that the YouTube channel will not let you chat. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, but you are here. Good. And can and Kathy says she can't inter interact on YouTube. Um, and so that's really good to know, too. So um, I'm going to go to uh, Donna originally asked a questions. Uh, she says, one of my questions is um, how, what proven method or steps are there for scheduling with a venue? Where is the starting point for this? And that is an excellent question and one that we kind of just alluded to. But to me, it, it there's a principle um, some people recognize it called the man of peace. Um, that when, when you go into a new land, you find someone and it's, it's been termed the man of peace in that area. And that is the person that connects you because you don't have any connections. You're going to a new town, you're new there. They don't know if they can trust you. They don't know what you're about. And so you build a relationship with somebody who already has those connections that people already trust. And once they trust you, you get vicarious trust. They, <laughs> they trust you because this person trusts you. And so that's where those raving fans really come into play. And I've had, I've just been super blessed with having several of them in my life. And they're, they're the number one reason for why my business is um, doing so well and why it continues to grow is, is that they connect me to the people that make the decision in a, a very nice museum, which uh, my first class there was sold out. It was uh, with a waiting list. It was awesome. Uh, this was six, seven, eight months ago. And she, there was a lady that attended my class in another town and she just went bonkers, you know, over the whole thing. She went back and she was actually friends with the education director at the museum there. And, and so she had her contact me and I was like, yes, I'd love to do a class there. And those are the key things. And so again, in life here in the South, we say it all the time, but it's not what you know, it's who you know. And so never has this been, <laughs> sometimes that means a derogatory thing, but here it means a positive thing. It's not what you know. You could be an excellent teacher and never get any formats to be able to be able to do your classes on. It's who you know. And so you work on that relationship, you put time and energy and resources into those relationships, and that gives you the opportunity to be able to get in front of the decision maker, make your proposal about how this works, right? There's an MOU on the um, file section here that can help you with that, um, give you a bit of structure for, uh, for how you do that. Uh, but it is the, these, these key, um, connections and that's been the way um that kind of has a tendency to build up a momentum um i'm in uh six different uh, uh museums and art centers on a regular and reoccurring basis now and because of that when i go to one that i don't like when i talked to the island last um saturday i didn't have a relationship connection there right I had I started talking to the person and actually started talking to them for a couple months um, and talk giving them a link to my dynamic for fluid art Facebook page that where I told them here you can see um, real pictures real students real videos during the uh, workshop and you can see what it's all about and um, and I offer a I could say I, I tell them I will give you a list of uh, people that can make recommendations for me and give me a reference. Um, and I list um, the different um, uh, museums and art centers and their uh, person's name and their phone number that I can call. To my knowledge, they've never called. <laughs> but just the fact that I'm saying, here, check me out. You know, I'm legit. And, and they're going to say good things about me has been enough to go, yeah, we'll try a class. Right. And so far, Praise God. But so far, every time um, it's been uh, they've had some sensational responses from the students. Now, I don't always go into a new venue and have them have a sold out class. That's happened a few times. But sometimes I start and I, and I tell them from the uh, from the get go, I said, they said, what's your minimum number? And I say, I realize that sometimes people need to experience this and then they become really excited about it. And they invite their friends to the next one. And so I'll start, I'll do a class with a minimum of four people there. And I've had to do that. Um, one class that I started at a venue that I'm in monthly. now the first class had three people in it. 
And again, one of those people was a raving fan. They just went crazy over it. Ironically, this person helped me with a lot of my initial marketing and she's never been back to another class. She, she said she wanted to, but she got busy and did some other things and we're still in contact. But she, so it wasn't that she was a returning student of mine that made things really great. It was that she had helped me with some marketing and she went and actually talked to the director of the and the executive director of the program and said, you need to get Casey back here. That was an awesome class. He has a lot to offer. You know, it was a great experience. And it was because she basically validated me and the my classes. And now I go there every month and sometimes twice a month. So again, it's those human connections that we have. So in answer to your question, Donna, um, it is very, very relational, but you can also approach it as far as building that relationship with people and maybe it takes some time to get there. And you can just kind of come out with it. Now, Don, I know that you uh, have taught classes before, different styles of class, and so you probably already have some opportunities within your existing structure and relationships to expand those. But new venues, um, you, can, you can use your history, you can use that as uh, social proof that you are doing well and that you can teach. I do recommend that you start a separate Facebook page as a minimum, maybe a website. I don't know that we need that anymore because Facebook is just so, <laughs> it's, it's got it all. It's all there uh, and easy to use and everybody's on it. Uh, to um, to valid, give you social proof, give you validation, but a specific a spe a Facebook group that is for, or Facebook page for your fluid art teaching, not just because I know you teach other forms of art too. And so there's several other people on here. I know Kathy does as well. And so, uh, and it, it doesn't cost you, you know, anything uh, to do that. I have 10 business pages, Facebook business pages. Some of them I use a lot, some of them I use a little, um, but hey, they don't cost me anything. I set them up and they're kind of building history on their own. I can go back and re-engage with some of those that I haven't um, done a lot of work on, you know, lately. Um, just the fact that it is three years old, six years old, has some uh, uh, validity in and of itself. Um, and let's see, um, Debbie, you said, um, what is provided by the venue normally? Okay, so we've hit some of those things. I'll try to fill in the gaps. Do you contact them with a proposal or do they contact you? What is a typical fee? What... Uh, who does the advertising and what is most effective? What is your typical age group? And do you charge the same for children's classes? I don't do children's classes. What length of class do you find is best for the attention span and materials um, used? Good. All right. So let's hit those one by one. Um, what's provided by the venue? Almost everything. They provide... Um, not only the room and they, they usually set up uh, the table. You, you, they're, they're usually, well, let's start from the very beginning. They are handling enrollment and payment. So I don't deal with any of that. I invoice them at the end of the class and usually within 30 days they have sent me a check. And so I just have an accounts receivable folder and I'm making sure that I get my checks, you know, that way. But this is a business. You got to treat it like a business. I understand that, you know, they, they write those checks once a month at the end of the month and, you can wait, you know, until then. Uh, they're doing a lot for 30%. Um, and usually, especially in the beginning, they're doing so much that I almost feel bad for them. I'm like, you only made like $300. <laughs> and you did a lot of work for that $300. There is a side benefit to the program. Like um, the, the main one that I teach at in Vadosta, Georgia, they have a lot of grant funding. And so they have, I think that they have a $3 million annual budget. Um, I, I can't remember. So I, I don't know that I've heard, heard that correctly, but they have a lot and they do a lot. And so part of their grant funding is, is they're reaching out to the community. Well, how do they, sub, how do they substantiate that they've reached out to the community? Right. Some grant funding might be reaching um, uh, underprivileged um, uh, minorities. Right. Um, well, how do they prove that? Well, several times I've had people come to my classes and I noticed on the roster that it said scholarship. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I've talked to the director, said, yeah, we, we paid for them to be able to come. I said, that's 
that's interesting. I said, you know, if somebody needs to come, I could make them, you know, I was like willing to cut them a deal or meet them 50, 50, or, you know, if people want to come and I got space and you know, I have no problem, you know, being generous that way. And they said, no, no, we, we got a special, you know, scholarship fund for that. That's been endowed by, you know, maybe an individual who wants to see art expanded. And so I've had lots of people scholarshiped full price into my classes, and that's nice, right? So they're getting that's a win-win-win scenario. Everybody wins. The student wins. They get to come when they otherwise couldn't afford it. I win. I get my full pay. The venue also wins because they have money allocated for that that they can't spend any other way. And it also helps them in their other grantee to be able to say, yes, we, we are accomplishing the goals of this particular grant. So that's... Um, uh, sometimes again, when I feel bad that they've done a lot of work, you know, for a little bit of money, they also are getting a lot more out of it that way. So go back to what is provided by the venue. Uh, again, you know, they're doing the marketing. Um, it is the list that, uh, is of the biggest value. The one that I was just talking about, uh, Turner Center for the Arts has 7,000 people on their men that are their mem members. Uh, they have their email, so they send them email blasts. Um, twice a month. They also send a, a physical um, a newsletter and mail it to their house. They also can uh, mention me in their other events, and, and they do. You know, they talk about when they're having an, something else going on there, and they're always having things going on there. Um, they could, uh, we've talked about, and haven't done it yet, I need to get on this, is to set up a display in the front about pouring art so that, because they're open um, from 10 to uh, 4, you know, five days a, a week, just for people to come in and see the art. They don't charge anything for that. So a display would be a smart thing for me to have done by now. <laughs> For them to go, oh, what's this? And yeah, I'd like to take that class and talk about current information. So, um, so I'm making myself a mental note to do that. Uh, they because in other classes, like let's like take the um, the guy who does teaches oil classes there. Uh, the students show up. He sets up, um, you know, with the with the students. They grab their um, easel and their chair and they've got their paints out and they do that stuff and then when they're done they put all that stuff away right and they're done because of the nature of what we're doing and that stuff has to dry on a horizontal surface for two days and i'm not there at cleanup one of the things that you need just to, to make sure that the venue understands in your mou your memorandum of understanding is is that you're not going to come back and clean up that that's something that they're going to do and so they have to agree to that so that's another part about what the venue does right and I try to make that as easy on them as I can. And one of the things that I've done in the place that I do uh, two workshops a month at is I bought um, some sh used shoe racks and put them in there. And I, the ones that are dry enough, I have the students transfer them over to the shoe racks so they don't have to clean them off the table. Now their big projects are still wet and they can't move them. And I, and you know, but but they the students pick them up and then the art director goes in there and excuse me, education director goes in there. It has to clean up a little bit, has to put away the tablecloths if they're reusable or throw them away if we use disposable and put the chairs back and put the tables back and all those types of things. So there's just an, an awful lot that the venue does for you. And it's it's more than worth it, um, particularly if you're shoestringing this thing. Uh, I do not recommend that you go out and rent a, a studio. That is scary. Right. You know how you need to really run your math and really make sure and preferably Build it as a mobile business first, like Gretchen did. Uh, see the Gretchen Wheeler interview. She uh, talked about how she, um, you know, she did mobile places and, you know, paint, hers was paint and sip, you know, kind of environments. And then she got a studio that seats 50 people, a good sized studio. So I would definitely build towards that if you want to end up that way. And that really talks about your lifestyle. You know, if you, if you want to be on the road, if you don't want to be on the road. I like I like uh, going to different places. Um, do you contact them with a proposal? They contact you. Well, you, you certainly don't wait for them to contact you. <laughs> uh, you reach out to them, and it's better to do so with the relationship with the with the man of peace that I talked about, with the person who is a, a raving fan. And if you so, if you can, and, and sometimes I encourage that process. I might be in the middle of the day going, "How many of you guys have uh, relationships with other art venues?" Because I'm willing to travel. Right. And they go, oh, I, my friend is, you know, this. <laughs> and I go, yeah, well, let's get together. Let's talk about that. And I make a mental note or physical notes or I'm handing them a business card saying, would you please email me about that? You know, and I'd really like to go to that town or do that in, in that facility. So 
uh, and that's good. Oh, and one of the reasons why I'm teaching at um, the university in the continuing ed program is, is that I had somebody in my class that was all, they also taught other classes in the continuing ed and they worked as a segue. They introduced me to the right person and so now I'm doing four classes in the fall there. Uh, and then um, the proposal um, is probably more represented in um, they have a certain way that they want to do things. The MOU helps the two of you to get on the same page and in the MOU that's here on the files section here uh, it states out very plainly, none of this is in concrete. This just begins as a discussion point. And so there's frequently there's things that I give on, there's things that I take on. Um, but it gets you on the same page so that you have an understanding of that I'm not going to travel back to the island two days later and clean up that mess. Somebody else is going to have to do that. Um, typical fee. I have a, uh, for the student, I have a wide range um, and I've just kind of worked it out. So and if you go to my dynamic fluid art, go to the events page on there and you can look at all the past events and you can see how the I've structured and even how I've kind of the structure has evolved um, during that time. Generally speaking, when I have somebody in both an all-day class, right, which is really four and a half hours, I go from 10 to 12, then we take a lunch break from 12 to 1.30, they come back at 1.30, and we go to 4, right? And that's that's an all-day. When people talk about teaching six hours, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> four and a half is enough. <laughs> that will that fills your day, you know, right there. When you got set up and break down, um, you, you probably do not want to be doing more uh, than, <laughs> than I really can't imagine um, doing more than four and a half hours that way. I could see myself doing two days, doing a four and a half hour, doing the next day coming back and doing a four, four and a half hour, doing something more like a retreat, uh, multiple day thing. But I don't really think that I could see myself doing doing more than that. We're we're all pretty tired, you know, at the at the end of that, you know, or or any more we'd be tired. We're kind of right on the edge of that. So there's still leaving on a high note. Um the uh so uh typical fees range from $29 to $150. The $29 is almost a loss leader for me, not really uh, but it's the morning section right there from 10 to 12. Now, I do that at different price structure to, at different places. So somebody can, let's say that somebody really loves this and they really, but they can't um, pay $100. They could pay $29 and go to the, the intro, what I call the fundamentals class. And they're going to learn the basics and they're going to do three, four by four tile. They're not going to do a canvas. So I'm going to teach them nine approaches and they're going to do three of them. And then they're going to have that and for $29. So I'm not out a whole lot. Those are 16 cent tile. And you can imagine, you know, the, the an ounce of paint um, on each one of those and some and some materials that I've had pre-printed and some other things. Right. So my costs are not it's 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 certainly not really a loss. Right. That's that's I'm making pretty decent money at $29 a piece with that. What I found is, is that sometimes people have to bite off on a, a small bite. And right now I'm running about 80% of the people that just sign up for the morning session for $29 are having so much fun. And of course, I'm talking up the afternoon. This is what we're going to do this afternoon. And we're going to do, you're going to do this big canvas this afternoon. Those of you that are signed up for this afternoon, by the way, I have three seats left available for this afternoon, <laughs> right? Is that they will go to the venue, they'll pay the difference, and then they'll stay for the afternoon and come back after lunch. And so that's uh, about 80% of the time, people that just sign up for the morning, you know, they, they took that small bite at $29 end up spending a hundred because they'll, they'll pay for the afternoon um, too. So in the, in the weekday, the afternoon is $69 and it, that changes based on the, I do three um, projects in the afternoon. Soon I'm going to do a table pour. So it's going to be three legged. They're going to get a three legged table. And so the supply cost on that is going to go up quite a bit. And so the chart, the, the, um, price is going to change. And I kind of talk that up with my students so that they know that it's not always going to be. So in the, like on a, on a weekday class, $29 for the morning, $69 for the afternoon is average. Although, you know, sometimes it goes up, you know, from there. Um, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Which works out to $100 per student if they're there all day, right? Um, the uh, On a Saturday, the prices go up. I still do the $29 in the morning. But I'll do um, like, um, what am I doing? $89, $99 in the afternoon for that. So the total is usually 118 
for uh, because I am giving up a Saturday, right? And so I'm, I'm building an incentive for them to go to the weekday classes, including people that might need to take a day off of work. If they have that day available, they can save that money and they can go. And so it, it kind of funnels people out of my weekend classes and into my weekday classes. And that's good for me. Um, now, other venues, I have different costs. And so if I am going out of town for that, I have got to do something to include my time. Uh, when we went to the island, that also included two days in a, you know, a, a hotel, you know, and, and I have four children, so we need a suite uh, for that. And so uh, instead of it being $100, it was uh, $150 for that. And so when as I go back, this is an important point too, um, it's probably going a little longer than maybe you're planning, but <laughs> than I was planning. The uh, sharing all my secrets uh, with you. The um, uh, the first time that I go to an area, I don't offer a morning and separate afternoon, right? Usually, um, because they're all brand new, so they all come for the whole day. So the only it's a very simple enrollment process, and so at St. Simon's it was $149 to come to this class that started at 10 a.m. and ended at 4 p.m. When I go back, now all those people that want to retake my class, which is the bread and butter, you know, this is the, you're re returning students and they are excited. And so they're bringing their friends. And I tell them, I said, no, you don't have to come on the morning class. So I'm, I was there. Uh, I'm going to go back on September 1st. I said, on September 1st, you can just come in the afternoon. It's going to be a discounted price. Now, I would like for you to bring your friends. They can come to the morning session, and then you'll join them in the afternoon. And so I'm already setting up that they're bringing their friends with them, and so we're expanding. The um, uh, They were all worried about it being full. <laughs> I said, don't worry about being full. You will have first dibs. You know, just, just enroll. You know, you can go talk to Jackie, the education director, here today and um, I go ahead and sign up and you know save your seat and several of them did so that's great when you have that kind of excitement uh, about it but it's a it's a more expensive venue um, one is is that the venue charges 40% uh, instead of 30% for me but they did in our negotiation and this is in one of the one of the um, posts that's here is that I had already put in the MOU that I have a $30 supply fee and so I said I'm fine with the 40-60 um, split as long as we do the su supply fee is removed from that first and actually when I ran the math I do better than um, I'm putting more in my pocket than a uh, more traditional 30-70 um, split with a supply supply fee removed. So that, that MOU gives you some negotiation room. Um, any negotiation is going to be give, you know, expect that, you know, on each, on each part, you're going to meet somewhere in the middle. That gives you some ground, you know, to be able to say, oh, okay, well, I'll do that, but, right, um, I'm going to need this from you. And so maybe they say, we don't clean up your mess. You have to come back in two days, you know. Well, you run your math and go, okay, I'll do that, but I'm going to need this. You know, you, we'll do a 25-75 split instead, right? So whatever it is that uh, gives you some ability to be able to do that. Um, good. Um, I contact people readily. I start building that relationship. I, I call, like, in the, I haven't taught in Pine Mountain yet. We have friends that live there, so we stay with them and a couple times a, a year. And so I was just like, man, when I'm here, I should teach a class. And so I'm beginning talking to, um, I probably had three communications, one on the phone where I introduced myself and said, I would like to follow up with an email. And uh, in the email, I gave them the links for my Dynamic Fluid Art page. They could go there and actually see videos and pictures of the classes. And uh, you know, they responded, yeah, that's exciting. We would really love for that to happen. And so we are currently setting up dates um, for the next year to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, be um, proactive and reach out. Um, don't expect them to buy off, uh, bite off on the whole thing in the first communication. Um, think about it in steps, right? Um, I'd love to send you an email you know, great, you know, I'd love for you to look at these things. Would you do that? Yes. You know, and you're not, you're not asking them to, um, uh, you know, pay you big bucks or whatever. You know, what is a typical fee? We've just talked about all those and the split. Um, by the way, I, some places, and actually that the venue that I speak, speak at the most, um, if I would not have had somebody validate that I am coming in as a business, this is dynamic fluid art coming to Turner Center for the Arts, and we're providing this whole package, right? 
that's bigger than, hey, I'm Casey Corbin, I teach art. Can I teach a watercolor? Can I teach this, right? They would want to pay me $25 an hour to do that. And they pay a lot of people to come and be teachers and they pay them by the hour because they make a lot more money, right? Um, that's going to sound tempting to you whenever you're in the beginning stages. You're like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. You know, um, but the, then it doesn't matter if you got four people in your class or if you have 14 or 24 people in your class. You're just going to be working harder, right? You want to take some risk so that you get some reward. You know, this is um, entrepreneurship. This is business owner, right? You, you do handle this like a business and you'll make a lot more money based on you know that split and the percentages than you would if you were to just be paid by the hour. I personally want to stop as much as I can trading hours for dollars in my life. I want to provide services and be reimbursed that way. One of the reasons why I do the coaching for um, teachers here. All right, uh, your next question is, uh, who does the advertising, what's most effective? Well. Um, we both do. They do advertising to their list, and sometimes I have to stay on them. Um, we There was a time where my class did not appear in their email blasts, um, and I had to get on the education director, and I was um, very, very nice about that, but I actually had some problems with getting them to comply, and I had to go up the chain of command and I had to, you know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I was polite and nice, you know, about things. But I met with the executive director of the program. I never had to directly say, hey, you guys aren't doing your job, right? You, you didn't put me in the email blast for the last two times. Um, so I'm getting neglected here, right? Um, instead, uh, we just kind of talked about how exciting the classes were. She had already heard from some of my students. Um, you know, she, she was excited about other things. It created other opportunities for me. And she she volunteered. She said, we've really got to promote your, your classes. These are really excited. I said, I would really like that. You know, so well, we want to give you a separate page on our web page. And I'm like, that would be great. You know, <laughs> so I never had to go in like telling on anybody or you're doing a big fuss. Um, but I did have to be assertive about that. And so this is your business. You got to treat it like a business. I do a lot of marketing on my own. What I typically do is, is I'm pretty good about um, creating the images and which is no big deal. You can do that very easily. I can show you how to do that. And then putting them into a Facebook event, which is again, people see those Facebook events and it's got all the bells and whistles and they think somebody is a computer programmer that it took to make that. Don't be intimidated by that. That's a few clicks and a few copy and pastes and you're done. I can make an event in five minutes flat. I mean, from beginning to end. And uh, one day last week, I created like seven of them for my upcoming events and got them on, you know, got them posted to my page. You can do what's called a co-facilitator link to the venue. So now they have admin rights and they can come in there and they can change the image or they can change some of the script or they can change some things on that. And then when they accept that co-facilitator link, then it automatically goes to their events tab on their page. And so Turner Center for the Arts, when they accept my co-facilitator link, now it's not just on Dynamic Fluid Art events tab on their on my page it's also on turner center for the arts their page and there it goes it gets posted on their page and it gets easy to find on you, you just click their event and so that's that's been a big huge thing i build it because i i might change my prices i might change some structure i share it to them and i say okay when you make your flyer when you make your emails when you make your 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 newsletter use this information. This is the most up to date. It's going to be the projects that we're going to do that change from month to month. It's going to be the prices that may change from month to month. Um, so that's, uh, and then I ask my, I share it on my personal page too. I ask my friends to share it. Um, I also collect um, email addresses like this is my uh, my sign-in form here. I know it's backwards, you can't see it, but everybody signs in their name, their phone number, and their email address. And that email is gold. And so I put the email address. Um, and right now, I'm just using my. I'm not even. I'm, I'm thinking about upgrading to Constant Contact, but right now, I'm not seeing the benefit of it. I'm just using my Gmail account. I just load them in there. I once a month, I send them out. I have them sorted by location, and so it says in my. Uh, contacts, Dynamic Fluid Art, Tifton, Dynamic Fluid Art, Badasta, Dynamic Fluid Art, Thomasville. Um, and so when I have a class coming up there, I click that group and I send them, you know, usually I got some videos and some pictures, something of interest in there, something of value um, to them uh, so that they'll open the email and they'll say, hey, I got a class on the 13th, you know, you should come. 
uh, please invite your friends. And I always ask people to like and share. Um, you pl please post this on your web, on your social media. Um, please share it. Ask other people to share it. Uh, just ask directly. All right. They will usually do that for you. Uh, I do a typical age group. I only do adults. However, I have had them as as young as 11 years old. And my stipulation, I don't usually know that until I walk in, is that I've got a kid, you know, in there, 11, 12, 14 year old, uh, 15 year old kids have been in my in my class. My only thing is, I said, I can't. I'm not. I can't manage if anybody has behavioral issues or anything like that. Um, the closest thing that I had to that was I had two older teenage young men in my um, class once and, um, uh, you know, they were kind of talky and, and you know, got off task a little bit, um, but uh, they, they were okay, right? Um, uh, but I don't really like working with kids. I know people do. So I leave that up to my sister-in-law, Autumn Orozco. She teaches kids. And then... Um, so that kind of answers the charge for the children's classes, because I don't do that, I don't know. Um, and we talked about the length um, and attention span. So I'm real happy with my four and a half hour day. Um, and, and that gives people the versatility to be able to sign up for just the morning. Um, uh, mm, some people have maybe some health issues and they just really can't attend that long of a class. So I encourage us, I will come to my fundamental class this month next month then just come to the afternoon class and that's something that they can do and it seems to work out better for them all right let's see all right well we've handled a lot and i've gone uh 22 minutes over an hour now i've never really said this was going to be an hour or i thought it might actually be shorter <laughs> today um the thing that i want you to do for today is to take away an action step one thing that you can do, and I'd like to suggest that your action step is to email me at caseycolecorbin uh, at gmail.com and ask for the, uh, the this blueprint, and I will email that to you. If you want to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching with it and other things, then um, I'm available for that, and so we can we can talk about that and talk about how that works, and so. Uh, please do that. It has been really great um, talking with you all. And if you continue to ask some questions in the chat, uh, I'll try to answer them there as well. I want to remind you about next week at the same time is uh, I'm going to interview an artist named uh, Amy Smith. Now, she's not a fluid artist. She doesn't do acrylic pouring like we do, but she does abstract. And there's something that you can take away from her, I know. She has um, this piece about her, and she just kind of... You just kind of watch her in her videos and stuff and just kind of get lost. <laughs> and she has this freedom to experiment. And she that's pro part of her, uh, what she's going to speak into. She also teaches and she teaches workshops. So she, and she has a studio that she teaches out of. So she'll be able to address some things that I can't speak into. And so I welcome you guys to uh, come back next week. Um, same time. That'll be our one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Fifth. Um, one in a row Friday morning at 11 o'clock and and make suggestions if this is not a good time this was an arbitrary time that was picked and so maybe in the evening it works better for people so if you, you guys will let me know about that maybe those of you that are watching to the re watching the replay right now would be the best to speak into that as far as uh, in case I can never do 11 o'clock on Friday um, but if you could do 12 I could take my lunch break well I can do that pretty quick pretty easily so uh, Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, you guys are in replay. Feel free to ask questions in the um, uh, chat uh, below. And this is Casey Cole Corbin. See you next week at 11 o'clock for the interview with Amy Smith. Thanks for joining me.